Well, it's Monday, but it's A.D. 29 in the life of Jesus, event 53. And I promised you I would do some research on the out of context use of giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Uh, I did find, as I did an exhaustive search, that it's found in both Matthew 10:42 and Mark 9:41. But yes, indeed, they are taking it out of context. For this is the same event, event 53, where they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom, and Jesus has children gathered in front of him, and he's talking about causing them to stumble and the punishment for that. But he's also talking about if you give even a cup of cold water in the disciples' name, or give the disciples a cup of water, that you'll not receive your bless, you'll not be deprived of your blessing as a result of that kindness or that act. That does not justify uh, giving aid to people who will use that aid in an ungodly way. Now, so many people take the position that I, it's my responsibility to give it and it's God's responsibility to how they use it. That's not what the scripture teaches at all. Uh, here it's dealing with uh, doing right by these little children, uh, but uh, it is certainly not casting pearls before swine. So uh, those are the two verses that where it's found and you read it carefully and you'll see that it has nothing to do with giving uh, gifts or benevolence to those that are unworthy of the benevolence that they're getting. It That's not what this passage of scripture uh, has to say. Now we're in uh, event 53 because there's a multifacet to event 53. That is Jesus is in one place and he's been teaching and doing things and uh, they're all listed uh, in the study Bible that I have is event 53. Interesting thing is that who's the greatest in the kingdom, uh, who's the greatest among these disciples is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, after that event, there are other events recorded and they're all different uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so we're gonna work through all of the events after that that are at the same time frame and Matthew, then we're going to look at Mark, and then we'll look at Luke. Uh, but they're all in the same general time frame, so this chronological study we're doing uh, will uh, definitely stay in the same chronological order, but the events may be slightly uh, different in the teaching of the disciples. The one we're going to look at tonight is found in Matthew 18, uh, beginning at verse 15, 14, 15, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what happens when a brother sins. Now understand the first word that's critical here is brother. This is another believer. When another believer sins, we're to go to them in private, reprove them, and if they listen, we've won a brother. However, it goes on and says in verse 16, if they do not listen, go back and take two or three witnesses with you so that they will hear both your side and the sinner's side and if the sinner in fact is a sinner and he doesn't want to repent uh, that there'll be witnesses to that effect it may also prevent a very bad misunderstanding when we didn't understand and we were wrong in accusing them uh, of sin uh, so it's a double check it's a it's a good thing uh, third in verse 17 it says if they still refuse and they're it's still been still evident that they're sinners and need to repent of their sin, then you take them before the church and uh, the church hears. And uh, if the person is still unrepentant and refuses to change, uh, that we're to treat them like Gentiles and like tax collectors. Now, that doesn't mean that we treat them uh, in a cruel or unusual way. It doesn't mean we stop loving them. It says that we just separate ourselves from them just as we would for a Gentile or a tax collector until such time as they should repent and turn back to God's ways. Now this is good advice for anyone who wants to confront sin uh, to be sure that they do this in private and in love. Second step, bring some other witnesses so that both sides can be heard and the facts really established. And then third, finally to the church. And again, if they still refuse to repent and it's, it's obvious that they are guilty of what they've been accused of, uh, that we separate ourselves from them 
That doesn't mean that if they later ask for forgiveness, we shouldn't forgive them or receive them back into the church. But uh, there's no question that there's a, a proper procedure for this. The next passage, the next section of this passage of scripture is one that I've heard taken out of context early in my lifetime as a Christian. And that was a lady in a church years and years and years ago who wanted to justify the purchase of a $55,000 Hammond digital organ. Uh, and she used this passage that if we, whatever we bind on earth, we can bind in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth, excuse me, in heaven could be bound on earth. And it says that uh, when two or three are gathered together and agree on anything, it shall be done for them. Well, that's not, <laughs> that's not the proper context in the total scriptures. Uh, we know that anything that we ask, whether it's one, two, or a whole thousand people uh, in agreement, it has to be God's will uh, for that to be done. And uh, I, I'm still not quite sure that God's will was for us to have a $55,000 organ uh, in today's money. That would be at least $75,000. And uh, the, the, very, the very fact that uh, uh, she had two people that agreed that we should have that organ, I don't think that necessarily meant that it was God's will for a church of about 100 people. Uh, in attendance to have a $55,000 organ, especially since there was nobody in the church that could play it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, misappropriation of this. But I do believe that when we know something's in God's will, uh, that uh, whether it be one person or whether it be three people or two people, uh, and we're in agreement on it, that we pray for it, that if it's in what God's will and his timing, it will come to pass. And I think that's a much more appropriate use of this particular passage of scripture. And uh, so I hope that uh, as we've looked at this particular event uh, in Jesus' life, in AD 29, uh, that you, and, and as you look at other scriptures, that you'll look carefully at context. One more thing that I want to say about a brother that sins is it would be good if you wanted to take a look at some scripture uh, on that subject, that you would look at Galatians 6.1 where it clearly says that even if somebody is caught right in the very act, uh, that you go, that if those that are spiritual go and confront them with that fact and uh, that you are uh, saving a brother if you get them to repent and return to Christ uh, in, in what they've done. And, and then in Luke chapter uh, 17, verse 3, again, it talks about a brother that sins and it talks about the fact that uh, if they repent, that we should forgive them. Now, you say, well, how often should we do that? Well, in the scripture very clear in Luke chapter 17, verse three, it says, even if they sin seven times in a single day and they truly ret return, repent, and ask forgiveness that we're to give that forgiveness. They say, that's a pretty tough pastor. How can we do that? And you'd say very easily, because God does that for us. Even when we sin multiple times in a single day, when we repent, we turn back to him and ask his forgiveness. He always gives it. So we need to remember that what we expect from God for ourselves, we ought to give to others as well. Those are good passages of scripture to study. Uh, discipline within the church. Uh, bringing back your brother into fellowship with God and with your fellow brothers and sisters and uh, finding that uh, we can give a, co a cup of cold water uh, to those that uh, are deserving of the cold water and that uh, that it will uh, be in God's will, that it will be a blessing and God will not uh, take that reward away from us. That's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day.